All right, so welcome to the first episode of the CO2 Laser Cutter Build Series. Now the idea with this build series is I'm going to be doing a deep dive on building a CO2 laser cutter that I've designed so that you can see the ins and outs and get a really good feel for the build process. Now at the end of the series I'm going to be putting together full documentation, step by step guide, parts, plans, where to get everything, just everything you need to build your own as well. I want to start this episode off by looking at some of the design aspects of the laser cutter we're going to be building. Then, if we get time after that, we're going to jump on the tools and begin construction on the frame. So, without any further messing around, let's just dive straight into it. Well, let's start with the obvious first. This workspace that I'm in right now is the CAD program Fusion 360. There's a good number of reasons I chose to use this software to design my laser cutter in over some of the other ones you might be familiar with, but it's mainly because it's fully featured and completely free for everyone to sign up to and use. I'll put a link to the software in the description below. My main objectives for the version 2 design are ease of construction, scalability slash upgradability, reliability and ease of maintenance, and cost. In that order, the idea being that this won't be the absolute cheapest cheap way to build a laser cutter, but rather it'll give you a solid performing, reliable cheap machine because we spent a little bit extra when it was smart to do so. And that actually leads us in a perfect segue into the use of the 2040 and 2020 aluminium extrusion you see here in the construction of the frame. Now this stuff isn't cheap, but it's super easy to put together and it means that you can swap parts in and out as your needs change as well. If you watch my last video, you'll remember that I showed the different sized laser cutters that can be built with the same design I have here. Uh, now the idea is that if you say wanted to build a small version to start off with and then later discover that you wanted to build a bigger one, you can just swap out a few of those extrusions and you can get like twice the cutting area for hardly any extra cost. The one I'm going to be building will be designed to take 600 by 1200 millimeter sheets, which I believe is 2 foot by 4 foot for our North American mates. At the end of the series, when I put all the documentation together, I'll include plans for the smaller and larger sizes as well, so you can just build a size to suit your own needs. Uh, while well, sticking with the theme of ease of construction, I've tried to keep all of the parts as off-the-shelf components, rather than needing uh, particularly anything custom fabricated. Now, I didn't succeed 100% with that, because there are four parts that I designed to be 3D printed. And I think really if you were pushed, you could pretty much get away with only printing the Y-axis tensioners here and um, fabricating replacement parts for the other ones. Uh, but we'll cross that fence when we get there in a later episode. Now let's take a look at the gantry setup. You'll see I'm using V-slot and V-wheels for the Y-axis. V-slot aluminium extrusion is very similar to the T-slot, but the opening here has a fully chamfered edge instead of the stepped one of the T-slot. This means wheels with a 45 degree profile can run accurately up and down the aluminium frame, which lets the V-slot be used for both construction and movement. I used the V-slot and the wheels on the version 1 build, and I never really had a problem with them, and they're perfect for having the scalability that I was looking for as well. Um, as just getting a longer piece of V-slot aluminium extrusion lets the whole gantry change size without having to change any of the other components except probably a timing belt. On the x-axis however I've decided to try out a linear rail instead. Now this is a bit of a test for me because on version 1 this was also done with the V-wheels but what I'm hoping I'll get out of the uh, linear rail instead is just a bit more speed when I'm doing big engraving runs backwards and forwards. The way the frame is set up is very similar to my version 1 design as well. Basically all the gantry movements and super critical parts are all on the inner frame while the actual enclosure and outside of the machine are on a completely different standalone outer frame. This means all your focus can be spent making sure the inner frame is rigid and perfectly accurate and square and everything while the outer frame can just really be whatever because it only needs to block the laser light and capture the smoke. So if you wanted to save some coins you could really make it out of anything. Um, even plywood or cardboard, um, maybe not cardboard, but you get the idea. What it also means is that the machine can take a knock while you're say loading your materials or something and it should only affect the outer frame and not mess up any of your axes alignment. You'll also notice I haven't made room for the electronics in the frame and that's because I wanted to maximize the cutting area for the overall size footprint of the machine. So as in version 1, the version 2's electronics will be mounted in a separate box that's placed under the machine. The design also has space for allowing pass-through of material. 
So if you want to cut or engrave something that's larger than the machine's bed size, you can do that by hanging it out the sides. Speaking of hanging it out the sides, upgrading the size of the CO2 laser tube isn't a problem either as an extension box can be mounted easily over here. For those of you who don't know, a CO2's laser tube power output is somewhat proportional to its physical size. So a more powerful tube is usually also quite long, which can cause problems normally if you say wanted to go from a 40 watt tube to an 80 watt when the frame doesn't allow for it. The Z-axis and cutting bed I'm doing it in exactly the same way as version 1 with lead screws and linear bearings being manually driven by a belt. In my opinion having a powered Z-axis is a nice to have that can be optioned later down the line rather than an absolute must right away. Now the final thing is the smoke extraction which I haven't added to the design yet as I'm still working out the best method and I may have to do a little bit of trial and error once I've got the machine up and running. Probably should have mentioned this at the beginning but I wouldn't be surprised if some of the design changes as I go through building this thing which is why I wanted to wait to the end of the series before releasing all of my build files and stuff um, but there we go. That's the basic idea of the design. I was trying to race through it so I, I didn't bore anyone but I was also kind of trying to be thorough so apologies if I missed something or if you have a question just let me know in the comments. Now because everyone was so quiet and paid attention let's jump out to the garage and actually get onto some building. The first thing I'm starting with is cutting the aluminium extrusion down to length for the XY gantry slash inner frame. Uh, to do this I'm just using a standard wood miter saw. Now ideally you want to get yourself a proper blade for cutting aluminium but I am just using a 60 tooth wood blade and it works okay too provided you take it slow. Now to make sure my cuts are accurate I'm cutting pieces of the same length at the same time by taping them together and clamping them down to the saw. This makes it heaps easier when you're trying to make your frame axes square to one another when it comes to assembly. Um, if you don't have access to a saw or you don't feel like shooting little chips of aluminium all over your garage I think quite a few of the aluminium suppliers will cut all the lengths to size for you for an additional fee. Now I want to show you this cut in real time so you can see how slow I'm feeding the saw through the aluminium. Now this is definitely on the safe side but you get the idea. So the process is really the same for both the 2040 and 2020 extrusions. I'm just making sure that when I'm gang cutting like this I have all the pieces tight together and secure. Uh, then it's just a matter of making my way through the cut list. I'm cutting all the pieces for the XY gantry and inner frame as well as the Z axis bed frame but I will leave the cuts for the outer frame just for another time because I want to get through this quite quickly and I'm not sure if my dimensions might change by the time I get up to that anyway. With all the pieces cut I can get onto assembly of the inner frame. At the moment I'm just going to assemble on a piece of plywood that I had handy but once it's built and I can really see the dimensions and the layouts and things I'll build a custom platform for the machine to sit on. Assembling the 2020 extrusion is really straightforward, though it can be a little fiddly sometimes. There's a bunch of different ways to fasten them, but they mostly revolve around using the slots in each of the sides to trap a nut so that things can be screwed into it. I'm using these corner connectors to join the ends together. The best way to use them is to preload them first, so I'll take a T-slot nut and an 8mm M5 screw and loosely put them together. Then I can just slide the T-nut into the slot on the extrusion and tighten it down. Here I'm using the larger of the two types of corner connectors that I have on these inside corners. The smaller ones that I'm using are for connecting pieces kind of crosswise, but they have these little alignment tabs on them, which are great for the inline type connections, but not so much for what I want to do with them. So I actually had to remove the tabs off one side with a file, and I actually ended up having to do that for about 60 odd pieces. So note to self when specifying parts in the part list, get the ones without the little tabs in the future. Um, as with the other connections, it's best just to preload them with the nuts and bolts first. So it's a good opportunity to sit down and have a cup of tea. With my preloaded connections, I'm assembling the 8 2040 vertical supports. As you might have noticed, the name of the game with this stuff is batch assembly. It does just make it go a bit quicker in the end. Speaking of which, I'm looking at the frame that I assembled just a minute ago and I've realized, much like a map maker getting lost, I've failed to follow my own plans and I've assembled the corner connections actually around the wrong way. So I'll quickly sort that out and I've made another error. As much as I want to edit this out and pretend that I'm perfect, I think this will make a good lesson. Because of the way 2020 aluminium extrusion captures the T-nuts, you need to slide them in before you close off the ends, which means that it's quite particular about the order of assembly. So to slide the vertical supports in, I have to put those in before I screw the bottom bits together. Which is very obvious now that I'm saying it out loud, but I just wasn't thinking a step ahead at the time. 
Sliding multiple connections in can be a little tricky as the T-nuts often want to spin when you try to push them in. So just give them a little jiggle and guide them in one by one and don't try to rush because when you're a professional like me, you'll know that... <coughs> so as I was saying, I can now slide all the vertical supports in for both sides. And I've made the executive decision to leave everything a bit loosey-goosey rather than tighten it all down again because the chances are something will have to come off again before this is all said and done. I can now slide in the V-slot rails and as I said earlier when we were talking about the design, the V-slot will be used for both construction and gantry movement. So from henceforth, I shall call these pieces the Y-axis rails. With those in place, the last piece, for today at least, is the X-axis brace that will one day hold the laser tube mounts and mirror number one. But that will be for another episode as I'm still waiting for more parts to arrive. Well, we made a good start. Uh, we rambled on about design considerations and got the inner gantry frame loosely assembled. On the next episode, I'd quite like to work on the X gantry rail and maybe get some things rolling around. But until then, remember I post updates and behind the scenes over on my Instagram. And if you have any questions or comments, do feel free to drop them below. I'm going to go get another cup of tea and I will see you on the next one.